Are you wondering about iron regulation throughout your body? Maybe you got some blood tests that are showing some numbers that don't make sense, or you have anemia, or you have iron excess, and you just kind of want to understand in a more intricate way what's going on with iron regulation in the human body. My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to cover a lot of the subtle aspects of iron regulation. We're going to look at the role of hepcidin the role of serioplasmin and copper, the role of the immune system, and some testing and things to consider when you really want to understand your specific iron regulation in your body. So as I said, my name is Dr. Taranella, and I make these videos to help you get a better understanding and go beyond basic health. But this video isn't tailored to any specific person, so please read this video disclaimer before we jump into the details. All right, so here we're going to talk about iron regulation in the human body. And of course, iron is a fundamental element for various biological functions in our body. It functions in things like the mitochondria, which is used for respiration and metabolism, DNA biosynthesis or production of DNA, hemoglobin, of course, and the carrying of oxygen throughout the body and many other areas as well. On the other hand, excess iron can definitely lead to problems too, like severe organ damage, which is facilitated by the production of reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species, as discussed in previous videos, occur via something known as the Fenton reaction. And then yet again, going to the needs of the body, not enough iron can definitely lead to some problems too that don't feel good, like anemia and fatigue. So your body has to strike a balance between these two cords. Too much iron, not enough iron. And sometimes it gets things mixed up and we have to intervene to help the body out, especially in terms of excess or too much. It's key though to know the difference because if you're trying to give more iron when you have too much, that's going to be a problem. And sometimes some of the lab metrics and things like that can be confusing and make you think you have too little when you actually have too much. So your body actually uses a very meticulous tracking system and storage mechanisms to carry out this balancing act. And it involves collaboration with different things like bone marrow, intestines, liver, immune cells, and all those things kind of collaborate in a dance to create stable iron throughout the body. We can get some when you need it, and when there's too much floating around, it tries to put it away in storage places where it's not going to cause damage. So this is the iron regulation in the human body, and it starts with your dietary consumption of iron. So dietary iron comes in two basic forms, Fe2 and Fe3. The Fe3 is more so from plant plant bases and the Fe2 is from animal sources. The body actually prefers the Fe2 form in order for it to be absorbed through the intestines and get into the blood. And that's referred to as ferrous iron. The Fe3 is ferric iron. So in the intestines, there's different parts of the intestine and different parts of those intestines do different things. But in the duodenum and upper jejunum, which is more so the upper part of the small intestines, that is where the type 3 would be converted into the type 2, depending on the source of that iron. And that process is particularly occurring inside the intestinal cells. So getting that iron from the intestines into the bloodstream requires several different steps, which are pretty important to understand in this overall process of iron regulation in the human body. So the iron is actually transported into the intestinal cell via an iron exporter, which is abbreviated FPN, and that stands for ferroprotein. Once that iron gets into the intestinal cell, so if you have the inside of the intestines here, and then the iron has to get into that Fe2 form, then it can get transported through that FPN transport protein, and then it's sitting inside the cell. Once it's sitting inside the cell, it's going to get converted back into the Fe3 form, and this occurs through a copper-containing enzyme called ferroxidase. And this is important to do because the intestinal cells can also be damaged and that other form, the Fe3, is a more stable, less likely to damage form. So once it's sitting in here, then it's going to hop onto a transferrin protein, which then will allow it to go out through the bloodstream. So the transferrin is an iron binding protein that basically transports the iron throughout the bloodstream. And it acts like a shuttle, basically ensuring that the iron is safely transported to where it's needed 
and it's in that more stable form, the Fe3 form. This is one of the iron regulating mechanisms the body uses to prevent iron from causing oxidative damage, one being bound to that transferrin and also being in that other form. At the level of the tissues, once it goes through the body and gets to a place where it's needed, say the bone marrow or liver cells or something, that transferrin is going to bind to a receptor called the TFR1, and then the iron is going to be taken up into that cell. So at this kind of stage, when you're taking in iron through your diet, the intestines kind of act like a gatekeeper for iron absorption. And that main gatekeeper is that initial iron getting into the intestinal cell, that ferroportin or FPN transport protein. So that's one of the key regulatory mechanisms determining whether or not iron from inside your intestines gets into the blood. We also discussed the ferroxidase copper containing enzyme, where if you had lack of copper, you may not be able to get that iron once it gets into the intestinal cell into the blood as well. But there's actually a lot more to the iron regulation throughout the human body than just these proteins. For instance, inflammation and infection often change the flow of iron throughout the body. So for one, inflammation in the immune system will trigger an increased production of a protein known as hepcidin. Hepcidin is thought to be the master regulator of iron homeostasis or iron balance throughout the body. And there's always some hepcidin floating around or present in the body. But the more inflammation your body has, the more hepcidin it's going to produce. And when hepcidin is present, it's actually going to bind to that ferroportin transport protein and prevent it from taking in the iron. And these proteins are actually on all of our cells. In things like immune cells and macrophages, they are basically taking up any excess iron floating around too. And, and sometimes they will transfer it to other cells. But when hepcidin is present, it will prevent those cells from releasing it into other cells. So basically, hepcidin is going to inhibit the export of iron from intestinal cells into the body and also reduce the export of iron out of cells into other cells or onto the transferrin proteins. And that's going to lead to basically a stasis in the movement and flow of iron throughout the body. And it does this to reduce the growth enhancing effects that iron can give to infectious microbes. Another important thing to mention is there's an, a copper containing protein called seroplasmin. This protein also works like a ferroxidase in the blood to keep more of the iron in the more stable Fe3 form. So without enough of the seroplasmin, you're going to have more oxidative stress throughout the body and that can lead to more inflammation. And that inflammation then can potentially lead to more hepcidin production, which can then lower your iron absorption and transport and movement of that iron throughout the body. So to fully understand the regulation of iron in the human body, it's also probably good to look at how sometimes things go wrong with this process. So in conditions like hemochromatosis, which is a genetic disorder, it can cause excess iron absorption and lead to iron overload. And this happens because in hemochromatosis, Chromatosis, the hepcidin production is altered, and so there's nothing really to reduce the iron absorption through the intestines. And that's, again, one of the key regulatory mechanisms. Of course, you don't want to always reduce it, but you want to have a way to break the amount of iron coming in through the body. On the other hand, infections and chronic diseases, as observed in things like NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver, can also dysregulate hepcidin production. In these cases, there's an increased hepcidin production, reducing the absorption of that iron coming in through the intestines, but you're also reducing the amount coming out of other cells that are in circulation and particular immune cells like macrophages that may be trying to transfer that iron to other cells. So the net effect is downregulating the iron distribution and utilization throughout the body. So as you can see, regulation of iron throughout the human body does touch on a lot of different intricate and subtle things. And sometimes these things on an individual level can be tricky to figure out what part is occurring more and what part is occurring less. But doing iron studies like ferritin 
iron, total iron binding capacity, and also understanding the overall inflammation milieu in your body is going to help you understand where you're at in this iron regulation process and potentially where you're at with problems that may be occurring with your health. Ultimately, it's about helping your body balance out the give and take needed for proper functioning in all of the tissues of your body. So hopefully that helps you better understand iron regulation in the human body. If you do have questions about this topic, drop it in the comment section. If you want a more customized, usable answer, consider joining the membership program where I can dedicate more time and attention to your questions. If you like this info and want to continue getting videos like this, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time. Thanks again for watching.